Good morning. Bless us, pray as we begin. Father, we thank you for your great love poured out for us in the giving of your Son at Calvary. May you send your Spirit to be among us as we come to your word. And may you make our hearts open and ready to meditate on your glory, your grace, and your goal for our lives. Amen. When I began training uh, down at our college in Dublin, a few of us used to play a game or have a little thought experiment. What would you do if you came face to face with the primate, the Archbishop of Armagh himself? Would you tell him what you really thought of the state of the church? Would you? Would you? Well, tee hee, just a little game, until. At the end of my first year, I was at a meeting of the Irish Council of Churches. And who do you think I ended up sitting beside? Yes, the Archbishop. Hmm, will I or won't I? By lunchtime, the internal tension was unbearable and I could contain myself no longer. Well, I comfort myself that while there was a curate's job available in Armagh this year, God also thought that I should stay in Diamond Dromore. But this morning, our passage is about a man who comes face to face, not with a church leader, but with God himself. Now, Isaiah lived in the 8th century BC at a pivotal moment in the history of God's people. The single kingdom of David and Solomon had split in two. There was international conflict and threat of invasion. Rescued in the Exodus, the people had fallen into idolatry and gone after other gods. This is not the way it was supposed to be. They were supposed to dwell in a land of promise, to be planted like a vineyard that God would tend and nurture and grow so that they would produce the best fruit, an abundance of fruit to bless all the nations. But instead of justice, there was bloodshed. Instead of righteousness, God heard the cry of the oppressed. Even King Uzziah's reign, which was relatively good, had failed to remove the high places and altars to the other gods. Uzziah himself met a grisly end because of his presumption and hubris. Now, we pick up the story with the call of Isaiah, and Isaiah will be called to announce God's judgment on a faithless people but he was also called to proclaim hope. Now, in this rich passage, we're just going to pick out and focus on three things. God's glory, God's grace, and God's goal for our lives. Glory, grace, and goal. So first, glory. What do we expect when we come to church on a Sunday morning? Do we expect to meet with God? What do you expect? Something? Nothing? Anything? Are you open today to having an encounter with the living God in this place on this day? You know, I wonder, was Isaiah any different the day, that day, that he went to the temple? Because boy, did he get a surprise. Suddenly, he finds himself in heaven, in the very throne room of God. Seraphs, fiery burning angels, surround the throne. With two wings, they cover their eyes to avert their gaze from the one on the throne. With two wings, they cover their bodies to preserve their modesty. And with two wings, they keep themselves in constant motion around the presence of the King 
on the throne. Smoke from sacrifices on the altar fills the air. And the doorposts shake and tremble at the voices of the seraph's song. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The full earth is full of his glory. I mean, Isaiah's senses must have been overwhelmed. Now, our passage tells us that the hem of God's robe fills the temple. But if merely the hem of his robe fills the temple, then how big is the throne? And how big is the one who sits on the throne? Did you notice in the reading that Isaiah describes everything he sees except God? Words fail him because words can rise no higher than the hem of God's robe. Does our vision of God match up? Is it this big? Is it this glorious? No, in our understandable desire to speak of God's nearness, do we ever domesticate his greatness and blazing holiness? Do we make God small? You know, Calvin said, and I think rightly, that only once we've grasped who God is will we truly come to understand who we are. Like Isaiah, do we recognize that in the presence of God's full-orbed, radiant glory, that we are undone, lost, silenced? Is that why sometimes we try to keep him at arm's length? To dare to come before this God, we are utterly reliant on his grace. So second, grace. In the presence of such glory and holiness, Isaiah is so bereft of hope that he doesn't even ask for deliverance. God is not compelled to be gracious, but he is because of his incomparable, unimaginable, boundless love. Isaiah's vision wasn't given to destroy or crush him, but with purging fire to cleanse him from his sins, to remove his guilt, and to prepare him for the task that lay ahead. The seraph takes a coal from the altar, That's the place where sacrifices for sin are made. And he presses it to Isaiah's lips. So why lips and not heart? How often our mouths run away from us, don't they? With venom, lips can express a wayward heart. But when cleansed, can praise, worship, and proclaim. So in grace, Isaiah is not just forgiven, but his sin is blotted out and his guilt departs. Now we followers of Jesus know that beyond animal sacrifices would come a greater and once for all sacrifice of God's Son on the cross. So that all the sins of all the people of all time could be wiped away. That relationship with God is restored. And yet we still struggle with sin and shame, don't we? No, even after we repent, how often we drag guilt around with us like a millstone around our necks. We don't feel that the sin has been blotted out and wiped away. At least not until we feel that we've worked it off. Until we've done the forgiving. We end up making it about us rather than about him. Folks, it is all about him. You know, there was a... 
a difficult set of circumstances and time in my late 20s when I was really struggling with my faith life. You know, and when things are on my mind, I like to sort of take myself off just to try and get time and space. So I went for a drive along the coast and I stopped at a beach and I went and I sat on the rocks and it was cold and the wind was howling and the waves were crashing against the rocks beneath me. And I was sitting hunched over with my thoughts and I noticed uh, a colored pebble which seemed out of place just at my feet. And I reached down and I picked it up and it had been mostly worn smooth by the constant action of the sea, but it still had some sharp edges. And then I realized that was me. I was still a work in progress. And then that verse from Philippians came to mind. The good work which I have begun in you, I will surely bring it to completion. You know, these 15 years later, I still keep this on my bedside table to remind me of God's grace, faithfulness, and forgiveness. And you know, as that's true for me, it's true for you. There is nothing you can do to make him love you more. There is nothing you can do to make him love you less. Do you really believe that? Do you really know it in your heart? Now, Isaiah's cleansing was a necessary preparation for the task that God would give him. And we need the same. And our Lord and Savior knows exactly what we need. His grace stands us on our feet to be the people that he created us to be. His grace strengthens, molds, and prepares us to live in this world. And we need this grace for us. And we need this grace for others. And we need to keep this grace ever before us as we live into God's will, purpose, and goal for our lives. So third, goal. You know, just like Isaiah, each and every person here is called to be a bearer of God's grace to those around us. Me, you, all of us. God has a specific goal and plan for all our lives, yours and mine. Lives which will glorify and serve him, make us flourish and help see this world transformed. Now, my specific calling is not your specific calling, is not another specific calling, and so on and so on and so on. But God's goal for your life is the best, the best for your life, a life of significance and meaning, a life as it was intended to be, in your circumstances, with your history, with your story. Each of us touches the lives of those around us. Each of us makes an impact, even if we don't always realize it, but impact we make. It's like the ripples of a pond moving out further and further and further. No, each of us is like a ripple, and each of us is just as important. What is God's specific goal for your life? Are you pressing into it? Are you seeking 
his face, seeking his will for your life. Maybe you feel that the Lord can't use you that much. Too young, too old, not clever enough, not talented enough, unworthy, ill-equipped, inadequate. Your fear can be such a powerful obstacle in the way of us walking into God's goal for our lives. You know, just as I'm beginning to find out in my own life, it is absolutely worth it. It is absolutely worth it. You know, maybe a sense of frailty is precisely what Isaiah and we need so that we never get too puffed up or think too much of ourselves, but that we always know we need to hang on to him because he is our strength. He is our rock. His grace is how we live our lives. So what's his goal for your life? Are you living into it? Now we hear about God's specific uh, goal and call for Isaiah in our reading. God called Isaiah to go to the people and say, keep listening, but do not comprehend. Keep looking, but do not understand. Make the mind of this people dull and stop their ears and shut their eyes so that they may not turn and be healed. Isaiah's preaching will fall on the hardened hearts of people who become as deaf, dumb, and blind as the idols that they worship. No, please God, that none of us is ever called to that kind of ministry. But we might be. These verses warn us that God's goal for our lives can be hard, costly, difficult. Now maybe we have to deal with an unbelieving partner or spouse or family. Now maybe we're caught in a place where we work every single day and it is hostile to our very faith. Maybe we're disappointed with our lives, our church, our world. Perhaps the lesson from Isaiah for us is that we are not called to success in the world's eyes, but to faithfulness. The Lord hasn't promised that it will be easy, but that it will be worth it. It will be worth it. But you know, that's why his calling, his goal for us requires total commitment. Did you notice that when God asked who would go for him, Isaiah immediately replied. He didn't ask first, what do you want me to do? He simply said, here am I. Send me. You know, the Lord's goal for our lives will mean leaving behind old comforts and security, embracing new challenges and uncertainty. When the tough days come and come, they will. We need a vision and an experience of God to hang on to. Now, unlike Isaiah, most of us don't tend to get quite such stunning experiences to sustain us. But perhaps more frequent, if less dramatic, top-ups. But God's goal for Isaiah's life and for ours is grounded in hope. Verse 13 says that the holy seed is the stump. And written in Isaiah chapter 11, we find, a shoot shall come out of the stump of Jesse. Hope and promise. John's gospel records that the word who was God became flesh and dwelled among us. And we have beheld his glory. Jesus is the fulfillment of that hope and promise made so long before to Isaiah. 
He is a vision of God to us all. Jesus loved fiercely. He raged with compassion. He reached out with all his heart to the sick and the lost and the hurting. We, when we gaze on him, we see truth, grace, hope, salvation, peace, forgiveness. When we look at him, we see the face of God. Now here is a vision worth holding on to as we live out God's goal and calling on each of our lives. You know, when all is said and done, all the things we go through and experience in life, the frustration, the anger, the chaos, loss, hurt, confusion. Sometimes we just need to hang on. But we do so knowing that we have a mighty glorious one who sits on the throne of the universe. One who is in control and we feel lost in the whirlwind. So we cry out and we hang on. And we can trust in our Lord of grace to give us what we need and to get us through. Because he has a goal for each and every one of our lives. For me and for you. Glory, grace, and goal. You know, just as that day in the temple was a turning point for Isaiah, maybe today can be a turning point for you if you let it. You know, as I leave St. Mark's, my hope and prayer is that each and every person here will have an encounter with and come before the living God, will revel in his grace and will thrive as you live into his goal for each of your lives. Don't miss out. Please, don't miss out. Let's pray. Oh Lord, how great, how great you are. When we consider the works of your hands, when we consider the salvation, the grace, the mercy, the blessing that you have poured out on each and every one of us. When we think that you did not withhold that which was most precious to you, your beloved son. Lord, be patient with us when we run from you, when we make you small, when we don't realize just the depths and riches of your forgiveness. Be patient with us. But Lord, stand us on our feet. Help us to gaze upon your face, on your glory, your grace, as we try to live into your goal for our lives. And we ask this in the precious name of Jesus and by your spirit. Amen.